and the recommendations. Uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes, I will just highlight the important issues about bradyarrhythmias. Okay, we know that athletes who train very well, they are able to sustain heart rate below 60, uh, between 50 and 60, very well. Okay, and for adults, very, very unlikely will any, any adults uh, develop symptoms uh, below or in, uh, between heart rate between 50 and 60. However, there, we need to familiarize ourselves with the concept of relative or functional uh, bradycardia, in which case in few, in few select patients, you know, they may suffer features of bradyarrhythmias, even at a rate of between 60 and 70. Very few patients will, will experience that. These are people with less uh, uh, cardiac reserves. And therefore we need to be very careful in terms of uh, dismissing symptoms of patients. But however, the key problem is that the heart rate becomes too slow. Therefore, the, 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 the cardiac output gets compromised. And as such, patients may suffer from fusions of uh, peripheral hypoperfusion. Again, these are patients that will come in either reporting that they are fainted while they were busy uh, engaging in one activity or the other. And they, uh, they may report chest pain, which may be related which most often than not will be related to the underlying uh, precipitant, especially patients who may have suffered from uh, uh, myocardial infarction, especially inferior myocardial infarction. But again, a number of patients who present with bradycardia symptom, you know, uh, bradycardia as a future of the underlying etiology. For example, patients who uh, patients who are recovered from a burning shark suffering from severe severe hypoxia. Or patients who are picked up in the middle of the night, you know, uh, during winter, who may have suffered from hypothermia, and of course, traumatic brain injury, or patients with uh, uh, who have been beaten up in the, by the mob, you know, suffering se problem, you know, severe hyperkalemia due to crush syndrome. All of these patients, we need to have our index of suspicion, and we should be able to evaluate our patient from head to toe so that we are not just uncovering the underlying, the, the presenting arrhythmia, but more importantly, our emphasis will be on the underlying etiology or the line precipitant of the bradycardia in these patients. Again, we need it's important for us to look for fusions of peripheral hypoperfusion, of, of fusions of hemodynamic inst instability. Uh, which I've highlighted previously in these patients. Now, when we see this patient presenting with heart rate of 30, 40, we know definitely there's, some, there's a serious problem going on in terms of the uh, uh, con uh, conduction pathway of this patient, you know, and therefore the symptom the patient is presenting with, can it be explained by the arrhythmia? That's the first question. Most of the time, but we need to be very, we must pay attention to hypoxia because that is very common. People are getting recovered from bunny shark or, you know, or in an enclosed burning in a burnt, uh, burn in an enclosed uh, uh, environment, you know, will be a pro, will create severe, severe hypoxia for patients. But more importantly, drugs are very common. You know, people overdosing on digocin or beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. These are our first consideration. We must attempt to identify the underlying etiology so that we can be able to direct treatment to the to, uh, and address the problem. You know, uh, in all of these patients, it's important for us to ensure that the airway is patent and, and can be maintained. And uh, we must be ready to assist breathing in this patient through our evaluation and also provide oxygen if there is a need for it. You know, um, cardiac monitoring for the rhythm is very critical because that's, that helps us to underline, uh, to actually identify the underlying arrhythmia, uh, bradyarrhythmia in the patient. But more, we must never neglect oxygen saturation so that we can see if ventilation is adequate in the patient as well as uh, uh, intravenous access. And if we get intravenous access, 
please take blood for arterial gas, see if it's available, okay? And of course, if it's not immediately available, we can do a quick, quickly drop a sample in the our laboratory for urgent analysis, you know, so that we'll be able to, uh, especially we're interested in the pot potassium level in these patients with the bradyarrhythmia. And please perform full 12 lead ECG immediately in these patients. As a general rule, it's important for us to familiarize ourselves with the common conditions that we need to be screening for in these patients. Calcium channel blockers, beta blockers are readily available and a lot of people have access to these drugs either due to antihypertensive treatment of family members and people can simply overdose on these, on these drugs. So we need to have an index of suspicion for, for this. Um, Heart blocks are generally very common, and uh, we need to be able to quickly diagnose this from by look by when we do for our 12 leads uh, ECG. And for first degree heart block, we our focus is that we need to recognize that there is no failed conduction in any of the cardiac cycle. So by simply looking, the only thing that jumps at us is that the PR interval is prolonged which means it takes longer time for the, SS, the electric activity to transmit from SA node to the AV node. But all of them are consistent. And therefore, we, we generally believe that this is a very benign form of heart block. And that used to be my assumption. In fact, that has been the teaching for years. But very recently, I actually learned that these may not always be true. The longer the, the longer the delay, the more the risk of atrial fibrillation developing in this patient. And the need for artificial pacemaker equally increases, you know. So the risk is directly correlates with the duration of the PR interval. And that brings out the concept of marked first degree AV block. The moment the PR interval, we supposed to be maximum of 0 0.2 seconds, now is going past 0 0.3 seconds, then there is a trouble in the land. These patients is at risk of, you know, progression to second or even third degree at block and need and risk of sudden death then increases in this patient. Therefore, if we by any chance, pick up a patient with PR interval longer than 0 0.3 seconds or equal to 0 0.3 seconds, this patient needs pacemaker inserted. And therefore, we must make every effort to get this patient across to, uh, the, physio to the cardiologist. Now, it's equally possible that we have a normal, uh, you know, we have a P wave that is abnormal, bifid P wave, suggesting that the driver or the, the origin of the excitation is coming from within the atrial wall itself, you know? And this is typically due to atrial wall fibrosis, you know, is the main etiology in patients with developing pre nodal block. And this is essentially what we see in these patients, just that we, we need to be familiar with this as well. Second degree AV block, these are, we are beginning now to see field conduction. Then you see more P waves than QRS complexes, but we must recognize that Wenkebesch uh, phenomena or uh, Wenkebesch uh, periods represent circular blocks. Now, what essentially happens is that the PR intervals progressively lengthens, you know, before there is a drop. And most of the a number of antiarrhythmic drugs were, uh, uh, can be implicated in this as well. And this is just what we essentially see. We see PR interval that is initially normal, but gets prolonged, even more prolonged. Then you have a P wave that fails to conduct, and then the circle begin, uh, begins again. Um, atropine, again, we'll discuss the management all together, together in a short while. Uh, second degree, uh, Mopis type 2. This is an unpredictable uh, AV block, and this we must be very careful about. In fact, I prefer that the word transfer of patients 
ahead of referral. The moment we see this patient, we should not be giving issuing letter and telling the patient go to the go to the internal medicine uh, next week or two weeks time. Some of the people are very poor, and once they leave your facility, as long as they are not immediately having fainting attack, they may not. Their, their their interpretation of their condition may be different from your own interpretation. We should be making effort to get the patient across to the next uh, 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 unit so that where the patient can assess definitive uh, 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 treatment. So these patients, the PR intervals are usually constant. Either they are within normal limit or slightly above normal, but they will have a, there will be a fair blood in these patients. So very, very important. And they, you know, pay this patient typically will report syncope or they may, you know, and they are at risk of a sudden cardiac arrest. And then depending on the number of blocks or failed conduction, the more severe the, the condition of these patients. And we need to be very careful not to give atropine in these patients. They are usually not effective. If for anything, it decreases risk of, uh, of the patient. And third degree air block, this is where there's complete electrical and mechanical dissociation. But what you will see is that the P waves are occurring at regular intervals, while the KRS complexes are occurring at regular intervals, but there is complete dissociation, you know, in each of them. So we need to be able to identify this in our patient. And patient with Mobis type 2, as well as third degree air block or complete AV block, are at risk of uh, asystole, ventricular tachycardia, and sudden death. And therefore, these patients should be transferred to the cardiologist. Very, I will stop in a short while, but this talk cannot be complete without looking at bundle branch blocks. Uh, we are familiar with the Willem Marrow, the typical Willem Marrow, but my, the emphasis here is that wherever you see the world looks like the RSR pattern, the small notch, with a small D, uh, X and the tall R wave, or what you call the M shape or M pattern, signifies the position of the block. If this is occurring in V1, V2, then we'll say it's right bundle, and we we'll then expect the mirror image in V5, V6, due to incomplete uh, uh, indirect activation uh, of the, of the uh, the ventricular wall. And that's what's why the shape is like that. And these, we need to be able to recognize in these patients. And we, previously we used to say left bundle branch block, we used to be treated as a, a, a part of STEMI for hyperfusion, but these are since changed in the recent guideline. So except uh, we need to familiarize ourselves with Scaboga, uh, Scabosa uh, criteria, for, for, for classifying uh, uh, bundle branch block for hyperfusion. So we need to look at the vari variations in terms of the wide QRS complexes we tend to see in this patient with bundle branch block. But typically we need to know that we may see just a, a notched R wave here, but you will see that the, the, there is wide QRS complex in, in, in the affected lead, and then you see the mirror image of that in the corresponding uh, mirror uh, leads, so that we are, we, it's not every time we are going to see the typical M. That's the point of emphasis. Then also we must be able to recognize bivasibular block, in which case you see right bundle branch block with either of left anterior fascicular block or uh, left posterior vascular, uh, vascular block. So essentially what we then say is that you see identify right bronchial blind block, but you equally will see assist deviation, right, right, left assist deviation, you know, suggesting that we are dealing with a bivascular block. Or you see right bronchial branch block with right assist deviation, telling us that we are dealing with uh, more than just uh, a block. 
They gain trifascicular block, even though their concept of misnomer and there has very little clinical implication has equally been reported. And it's just a combination of third degree air block with either of these bundle uh, branch blocks that we must be familiar with, okay? So as you can see here, you have right bundle branch block here combining with right axis, uh, sorry, left axis deviation here. This is a typical example of, uh, of uh, bivascular block, and we should be able to quickly recognize this. Now, in now we've seen the various types of heart blocks. How should we patient be managed? Again, it depends on basic first and first, basic approaches. Airway is the airway patent. Can it be maintained? Is breathing optimal? Do you need to supplement with oxygen? Circulation, if you put a secure IV line, uh, have, have you provided, have you monitored the blood pressure and the pulse of the patient? Have you, you know, and also said, get, put, get a drip running and 12 lead DCG should be done. And you, depending on the state with the condition of the patient, if the patient is, is the patient hemodynamically stable or not? If the answer is yes, patient's hemodynamically stable, we should focus more time energy on identifying the etiology and directing our treatment to the underlying cause. If it's head injury, if a patient has suffered ischemic you know, hemorrhagic stroke with patient having fissures of raising the cranial pressure, atropine was contraindicated. We are not going to solve the atropine will not work. Is the patient hypothermic? We need to warm up the patient. Is the patient hypoxic? Ventilation should be our priority. As the patient so far, the inferior myocardial infarction, therefore we need to give fluid in the patient and we may need to optimize uh, inotropes. We may need to bring inotropes on board in this patient. So these are the ways we are going to approach this patient. But as a rule of thumb, atropine will be the first choice except there is contraindication and I've listed a number of contraindications in which atropine is not contraindicated outrightly or they have been proven not to work in this patient. And therefore, the next option for us is then uh, to provide either chemical pacing for the patient with adrenaline infusion and we should be comfortable to prepare adrenaline infusion in our, in our district hospital. All we need to do is just break 20 ampoules of adrenaline in 200 mils of normal saline and titrate. If you go in the middle, you can be wrong. Five microgram per minute with your infusion pump and therefore titrate to effect so that we can see the blood pressure of the patient rises as well as the, uh, uh, the heart rate of the patient. Just enough for the patient to, uh, you know, for you to achieve clinical improvement in the condition of the patient. If the patient was previously not lucid or not, uh, you know, having altered consciousness, has that improved? Is the patient having fissures of peripheral hypoperfusion in form of shock? Has that improved? That's what you are titrating the uh, chemical patient against. However, we should be comfortable to provide uh, transcutaneous pacing in our patients. And I've provided a list of uh, indications in which you may actually progress straight to uh, uh, you know, uh, transcutaneous pacing. And if you do not uh, regularly have access to the, to the defibrillator for this purpose, or you are not competent enough, you can simply just get chemical pacing ongoing. And what do we have? I've just shown a picture of what a pace, uh, when you, you know, what's a pace, a, a pacing spike, which is the driver of this QRS complex here, you know. And again, the same approach, you need to follow procedural sedation, making sure that you have obtained consent from the patient or the family member, as the case may be, and you simply attach your pad, and then the rest of the process of the machine will actually provide the guy, you know, can guide you through. But better still, the moment you 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 switch the machine on pacing, uh, on the, you know, they usually they put a pacing on the, on the knob of the machine and you can simply put it on pacing. The next thing is the machine we ask you, will, will immediately either set uh, the rate or better still, you may choose between 60 and 80, per, 80 beats per minute on the machine and you can easily adjust. 
there is no fixed rate. What we are interested in is you titrate this heart rate to the clinical improvement in the patient. If the patient is an elderly with underlying uh, cardiac comorbidities, you may need to choose a, slow, a, a lower rate. But if it's a young, fit individual, relatively fit individual, you may need to go to a higher rate of 80, and there's room for you to adjust this. However, if you say demand more, they simply would you tell you to select the rate that you wish you, you know, for the patient. And immediately you select the rate, then it's going to, you know, is you then proceed to the patient output, in which case you, you can actually start from zero and start to increase every five, five milliamps, or better still, you can go as high as 30. No pacing, uh, no electrical capture has ever occurred at rate less than 30 milliamps. So you can actually start at that rate. And the moment you you press you you know you you start your pacing, you will see the spacing spike originating and then move gradually towards the KRS complex. And the moment it gets to this point, you see the KRS complex widening out, and you will may be able to see the improvement in the heart rate of the patient as well. Typically, the heart rate if you had set the heart rate at sixty you would then see the heart rate of the patient either as around 60 or slightly above 60. And when that happens, we then say there's electric, we will say there's electrical capture. But now you, before you, you have to then check that the heart rate captured on the, on the machine equally corresponds to the heart rate on the side rib on the patient. So you have to then go to the femoral of the patient. Don't use the carotid because every shop you are delivering would equally transmit to the carotid, and therefore that may confuse your reading. So you must make sure that the rate on the on the patient is similar to what is shown. If that happens, then we we'll say there is mechanical capture. But what we are interested in is a clinical improvement, and therefore you may need to adjust the heart rate of the patient that you have selected on your machine if the patient's clinical condition has not improved. And whatever rate you have obtained. To get to clinical improvement, you would need to add 10% of the put of the of the patient output to what you have obtained. So that, that comes to the uh, that gives you total amount of energy that is needed for the patient. Now, once that has happened, you will need to then uh, discuss this patient with your uh, referring facility or your referral facility so that this patient can be taken transferred. Now if there is, how should this patient be transported? The, you need to call the, when you are discussing the patient with TMS, the, you need to be indicating that you have a patient who presented with symptomatic bradycardia who had been paced and the current patient output is this, and therefore they need to send advanced uh, life support provider so that they will come, back, come to, the, to pick the patient with their own machine. Because if each of these machines is about 25, 30,000, you are not going to be able to release your facility machine to the patient, to be transported with the patient. So usually they come with their own machine and they are going, the patient, when they, they, the ALS uh, uh, paramedic comes, they would do what we call step down uh, uh, pace, pacing for the patient, in which case, they will give uh, they will give the patient uh, a, a slightly higher dose of energy to if you are patient at 70 milliamps they will go to 80 and step down to 70 so that they can exchange a machine that is how we uh, you know that is how we transport these patients so again this is coming from the Resuscitation Council of South Africa and I've essentially discussed the content uh, that brings me to the end. I'm sure a lot have been, I've covered quite a lot in uh, one hour, and I'm sure a lot of people want to pick up on some of these resources and read to consolidate um, all the things I've talked about. Thanks very much uh, for listening, and uh, uh, thanks for your time. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Adenay. That was an amazing jam-packed session with lots of practical tips. What I'm actually going to do is when I'm going to post the videos, I'm going to split it into Tachy Arrhythmias and Brady, Brady, Brady Arrhythmias as two separate sections so that people can take their time. And I'm sure this is the kind of thing one actually would want to go through um, repeatedly. We've got a couple of questions. Uh, the first one in the chat there was just somebody asking about how to perform a 15-lead ECG. Um, in, in comparison to a 12 feet ECG. I know Dr. Adenay always does a lot of effort in teaching us um, about the 15 lead, or the, I assume it's the posterior ECG that he's referring to. Dr. Adenay? Yes. No, thanks very much. Um, that's a very practical question. The, if you, depending on the facility where you are, if you have access to system lead ECG, that is beautiful. But I can tell you that is not happening in most of the facilities. So what essentially we do is that we uh, we simply take your fourth, fifth, and sixth electrode in the of the of the chest leads, and you migrate number four to number seven, you migrate five to number eight, and you migrate six to number nine. What are their what are their respective positions? Number seven is fifth intercostal space posterior axillary line. Number eight is fifth intercostal space, mid scapular line. And number nine is fifth intercostal space, left paravertebral line. That is how we get posterior ECG. And that's essentially the, what the, 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 the colleague is asking. That is how you achieve uh, a system lead ECG using the standard uh, ECG. So essentially, when you uh, for you first of all start by doing the standard left sided ECG, in which case you will have obtained your lead V1 to V6. Thereafter, you will remove V4, V5, V6 and put them in the positions I've mentioned to obtain V7, V8, V9. When the print, when the machine prints out. The, the, the printout, you need to simply label four, five, six, you need to change them to seven, eight, and nine. So that anybody who is into looking at ECG after you have finished can equally make sense out of it. That is the way you obtain that. And that is indicated when you have obtained uh, horizontal, horizontal depression in your V1, V2, V3, in especially V1, V2, in which case you are suspecting posterior myocardial infarction in the patient. That is when you, this is indicated. However, you can do right-sided ECG in the patient by simply changing the orientation of the left-sided ECG to right-sided ECG. When you have obtained uh, inferior myocardial infarction in a patient, in which case you are specifically worried about right ventricular dysfunction, especially those patients who have got bradycardia. So you will want to do that. Or better still, you can simply remove your V4 and put it on the right side, on the, on the right, fifth intercostal space on the right side of the chest, mid clavicular line. And that gives you R4. And that has been shown to be very specific for looking at right ventricular dysfunction. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ney. I also see there's, I've just realized the name is still on this ECG. Um, let me see if I can get it off. Maybe I have a quick look and then I'm just going to take it down again. Uh, there's a question in the chat around this patient. Um, I'm just going to close this ECG and see if I can take the name off it. Um, but the question there is, um, I have a 68-year-old male, known hypertensive, defaulted treatment, previously treated for atrial fibrillation, uh, but the ECG in 2016 actually looked like a flutter. Defaulted warfarin in 2017, seen again in 2021 with no AF, but diagnosed with CHF and started on ferrucinide. So presented with a new onset CVA on Saturday with the irregular, irregular pulse, but hemodynamically stable. The ECG showed irregular narrow complexes with normal PR interval and occasional ventricular ectopics. And the question is, does this patient need anticoagulation? And this is a doctor from Dr. Hartwick in Adelaide Hospital. 
So the 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 question the question of uh, anticoagulation again, especially in patients with stroke, is we the focus is for we are interested in secondary prevention and the patient. So if the patient is still having uh, florid uh, uh, atrial fibrillation, there may be a need for it. But my advice is that we need to discuss the patient with the with our physician, uh, your the nearest physician so that they can make a decision on the patient. The risk of bleed, if you have, you know, we need to balance the risk of bleed from warfarin in this patient, you know, versus uh, risk of, re, you know, uh, versus the risk of the patient having another, another CVA. That's the focus, that's what we need to be most worried about. If we are able to successfully monitor Yes, there is. Yeah, the, the, this patient has got, uh, if, you know, is, the patient has got AF actually. The need to, the rhythm strip there is, is actually suggest, is highly suggestive for AF. So, this patient, the, when, the risk of INR monitoring needs to be balanced against the need for, uh, re, you know, against the risk of re bleed in the patient, especially if the patient has suffered stroke. So that is the main concern in, in this patient. Um, thank you very much. I'm just seeing if there's any last questions. Please, guys, there's a poll out. Please fill the poll in. It's also a way. Oh, I see Mr. Dr. Nolte has got his hand up. Dr. Nolte, would you please unmute yourself and just ask a question? Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I was just also a practi practical question. Um, I had an overnight call about a week ago and a 42-year-old male presented with atrial flutter, um, undiagnosed, no comorbidities. Uh, it progressively got worse over the time that I was looking after him. We had a real problem with EMS, not being able to attend to him uh, to, to transfer him to the next level of care. So very, very limited resources available at my facility. Uh, none of the drugs really that was discussed um, tonight. Uh, it was quite frustrating. In the EDL, they mentioned the use of midazolam as a, as a possible first-line agent for flutter. I was just wondering if Doc has got any comments or perhaps anything else that could have been tried in that scenario. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank, thanks very much. Um, mid midazolam is not going to correct the arrhythmia. But if the patient, uh, if the patient, you know, it's going to deal, deal with anxiety and you know, calm the patient down. But I think the, 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 in a patient like that, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, we want to understand the, what the precipitant. If uh, most of these people are using substances and critically we need, I think that's where we need to get into to understand the precipitant and the patient and be able to manage. Otherwise, if uh, the patient is unstable, then we will have to proceed and, and, and get, uh, you know, and probably get the patient anti-arrhythmic in the, you know. Amiodarone, amiodarone is definitely available in your facility. If it's not available there, I think uh, we need to just, uh, we advise you provide the motivation tomorrow in your facility, they can easily get it so that you it will save us the assholes of, you know, sometimes we feel helpless when there is nothing more we can do for the patient in the middle of the night. Okay. Thank you very much. I think it's an important point that we should advocate to have these things available. So quite often you might have had existing doctors and really know how to use this or just, and somebody just doesn't, doesn't advocate to actually order them. So being able to negotiate with your pharmacy and making sure that your emergency is stocked with all the things you need is something that you can actually do. And that contribution will also help um, future doctors that join, join your facilities. So you can make a big difference as a community service officer in, the, in those scenarios. Um, any other last questions? I don't see any hands up and there's nothing in the chat. Thank you very much, everybody. This has been a, a very academic session for the evening, but very practical and very useful. And um, I think in your next call already might might be, be bringing some benefit to your patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Adonai, for doing so much effort with preparing this presentation. And we will be sending around the links to the recordings tomorrow as well for those of you who want to go over some of it again. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, any last comments from you, Dr. Adenay?
No, um, I would no. They not so much, except that I just want to thank all the team. I can I can see quite a lot of doctors joining today into this section, and I hope they find they picked one or two things that, but uh, to to apply in their day to day care of patients. But more importantly, we need to advocate. If these medications are not available in our facility, it simply tells me we have not been requesting them. And therefore, what needs to change is that tomorrow morning, we walk up to the office of the person in charge of procurement in our, uh, the, usually the, the nurses. is the nurses, the matrons who are in charge. And if the doctors have not requested, they are not going to order. So we must advocate and make sure these things are, are ready. And we must equally take time to open those emergency trolleys and check the content so that we are sure that those medications that are there are factually not expired, you know, so that at least we can restock them and make sure they do regular checks on them so that uh, when we need them, they are available for use. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Anais. So a quick last question in the chat. Um, if a patient's allergic to amiodarone, what would you suggest as alternatives? The, the regular alternative that we use as antiarrhythmic is lignocaine. Lignocaine, but Thank again, we need, to, we need to be careful with lignocaine because there, are, there is intravenous preparation versus the IM uh, preparation for, you know, which we use for, for non being uh, sites of uh, suturing. So we need to be sure that we have the, the, the nurses have not stocked IM preparation in the trolleys for us to use. That I've, uh, I've, seen, I've seen that a few times. So please make sure you get the appropriate uh, uh, IV uh, use, and it's got better. It's got better tolerability than amiodarone, actually. So that's an option whether we can use at 0.75 milligram per kg. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I think on that last practical note, we're going to close the meeting for this evening. I'll be on for a few minutes just doing practicalities. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a lovely evening.